Our passage today comes from the book of Genesis. If you're unfamiliar, it's the very first book of the Bible. We'll be reading from chapter 12 and be reading from verses 4 all the way through verse 9. I read from the NIV, which will also be on the screen. You can follow along on whichever translation you have, or you can follow along on the screen. Let us hear the word of God together. So, Abram went, as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he sat out from Haran. He took his wife Sarai, his nephew Lot, all the possessions they had accumulated and the people they had acquired in Haran, and they set out for the land of Canaan, and they arrived there. Abram traveled through the land as far as the site of the great tree of Morah at Shechem. At that time, the Canaanites were in the land. The Lord appeared to Abram and said, to your offspring, I will give this land. So he built an altar there to the Lord who had appeared to him. From there, he went on toward the hills east of Bethel and pitched his tent with Bethel on the west and I on the east. There he built an altar to the Lord and called on the name of the Lord. Then Abram set out and continued toward the Negev. The word of God for the people of God. And the people of God said, amen. You may be seated. So if you're new with us or if you weren't here last week, this is week two of our summer sermon series is a nice little tongue twister for you. Our summer sermon series called Felt Board Faith. Every June, starting this year, we've done it for the last three, but it was in July. June this year, and June next year, and June the year after, until the Lord audibly tells us to stop, we're going to be going through the Old Testament. And we started three years ago in 2020, we started uh, with Genesis chapter 1. And then we did chapter 2, and chapter 3, and chapter 4, and chapter 5. We're all the way to 12. So based on this timeline, we will get to Exodus in about 2050, okay? But we're going to work through the patriarchs over the course of the next decade or so. And there's a very intentional reason that we do this. And the reason is, is because we believe from Genesis to Revelation is this is the total inspired Word of God. That the Old Testament is also the inspired Word of God. And and if we really believe what 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 says, that all Scripture is God-breathed and useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. And I know this may be a shock to some of you, but when Paul wrote that to Timothy, the only Scripture he had was what he was writing, which he probably at that point didn't consider Scripture, but he just had the Old Testament text. And so when he's mentioning that, he's speaking specifically about the Word of God that had already been written, as we call the Old Testament or the Hebrew Bible. We believe this is one story, but what we also believe is that from the very first page in Genesis, every single book points to Jesus. And so as we see the story of Abram that we're working through right now is is we have to recognize that when God says he's going to bless the nations through Abram is that is actualized in Jesus Christ. And that's why we believe one of the earliest heresies that plagued the early church was this attempt by a guy named Arian to remove the Old Testament from our understanding of God. And, And if you look at some of the earliest creeds, they were formed as a rebuttal to that reality. And so we believe, along with Orthodox faith, for 1,700 years or so, that this entire Bible is the inspired Word of God. In addition to that, is is my hope, is that by our engaging in the Old Testament, is instead of us maybe being afraid of the Old Testament, is we might see the story of God unfolding on every page. That we might recognize that even in the challenging parts of the text, we can still see God's love, grace, mercy, and the person of Jesus in and through the text. This all kind of materialized, I think it was the summer of 2017, maybe the summer of 2016, I was taking some seminary courses over the summer, and I was just trying as hard as I could to finish as quickly as possible, and, and I, I had three classes over summer, which is just the worst thing to have done, but one of them was biblical narrative, and one of them was the Old Testament, introduction to Old Testament. And I'm telling you this, this is how many years ago? Seven years ago. For the first time in my 35 years of following Jesus, I fell in love with the Old Testament. 
And the reason was is because I was able to take this step back and see this whole story from Genesis to Malachi, continuing on from Matthew to Revelation. I was able to see all of this as one giant love story that God is inspiring men to write, and maybe a woman or two to write, in order that we might know his love and grace today. And if you can just at least start there with trusting the story and then recognize that in the midst of that that it is this elaborate story of God's love to you, for you, and through you to the world. One of the things that in my life at least, and it may be the same for your life, is my wife and I have this uh, tendency toward nostalgia is what I'll call it. Uh, For an example, we love to go by the places that either she's lived or I've lived in our past. So let me ask this question. How many of you, if you're in the vicinity, right, like a five to ten minute drive of a home that you grew up in, how many of you are guaranteeing that you're going to drive by the house that you initially grew up in, right? Anybody do that? Come on now. So we grew up in the village. We grew up. I did not grow up in the village. My wife and I got married, and when we got married, I moved into her house, which is the way it should be, by the way, just a heads up. I just took all my stuff, burned it in a bonfire, and moved in with her, and it was perfect. Uh, But I moved into her house in the village, and, and we lived on a street called Huntley in the village, if you lived in the village. I feel like that's like the starter neighborhood for like every young couple that grew up in Oklahoma City, but that's fine. So we, we lived in this house in Huntley. So anytime, if you're in Oklahoma City, this is familiar with, if you're not, I'm so sorry, but anytime between like, if we're at Hefner Parkway all the way through Western and then from like Memorial to Grand, right? If we're in that block of space, there's like a 100% chance we're gonna take the longest way backward, back home to go by the house that we lived in together. For some of you, you're too young, and you're like, oh, we're not there yet. But you will be if you're anything like us. The one that's really important in my family, or in our family, is the house my wife grew up in. She grew up on 10 acres at Bryant and Britain. 10 acres, she had all the animals and all the stuff and all these different things. But in addition to that, is this house was in her family from 1980 to 2001. So for 21 years, it was the house that her parents actually got married at. And if you've been here for a while and you've heard me share the story, it's actually the house that I proposed to her at. And so if if my wife's in like a 15-mile vicinity, she's going to come north on Bryant to drive by that house. Because for us, places often have significance. And the reason is, is because those places on their own, like I sometimes go by my house I grew up in, like, no, like I wouldn't move back there, but every time I drive by it, I'm, I'm immersed back in the story of my life, the love, the experiences, the stories, the, the hard moments, the good moments, and, and all of that is an incredibly specific feeling for humanity, and, and I, I think we can actually see it in the story that we're reading today, is that places matter. Because places are directly connected to the experiences we have there. So let's go back into chapter 12. We had talked about this for a while. The reason we're doing felt board faith, the reason we call it this is because, I don't know about you, but this is how I learned about God's story when I was a kid. When I was in Sunday school, we had puppets and felt board characters. Anybody else, right? We talked about that. And so here today, we've got my friend Abram, and we've got my friend Sarai, okay? And so what happens is they're with his father, and they decide they're going to head out. God says, go, and they go, right? Which is just like the most essential early lesson of the whole thing. Is if God tells you to go, you probably want to go, okay? So they leave, they go down, they find this tree in this place called Shechem. In that moment, he realizes that the Canaanites are still there. Because if you see on our sign, Canaan, it's also on the sign back there, is that's where he's headed, which is kind of modern-day Palestine, Israel. And in this journey, what happens is Abram and Sarai, they encounter God there. God comes down and he reminds them that to your offspring, I'm going to give this land. And Abram builds an altar. We're going to come back to that. 
Then, and you can also see it on the map up here, whichever one you prefer. Some of you are more that brained, some of you are this more brained, okay? But he doesn't go by himself. He brings this crazy looking nephew named Lot. So the three of them, all their people, and they're just traveling from place to place. Like I said, after he leaves there, they pitch their tents outside of a place called Bethel or Bethel. And then, once again, what does he do? He builds an altar. And I just want to be forward with you all. This is one of those texts. So when I get into like sermon series, specifically this one, is I, I'm, I, probably about three months ago, I read through Genesis 12, 13, 14, 15, and I'm like, all right, what are the four or five Sundays that we want to focus on? And when I wrote this one, I was like, oh, cool, altar building. That's a nice title, and man, that's going to be relevant and pertinent to us as a community. And then I read the text on Sunday night last week, and then I read the text on Monday, and I thought to myself, why did I choose this passage? Because I was thinking, like, how do I make altars relevant for you and I today? How do I make what Abram is doing in this moment something that you and I can leave here and be like, I need to be an altar builder? And I was like, like I, I, don't, I don't build things. It's not in my DNA, right? Like, I don't... It's one of those things, my hands are too big, is what I've always said to my wife when she asked me to build things. But what I have been able to understand is that God is actually calling us, not as much literally, but metaphorically, to actually be altar builders, to build altars. Now, if you understand much of the Old Testament story or the way of the ancient Near East, most of the time that an altar was built, it was built for one specific purpose, and that purpose was for sacrifices. Now remember, 3,000, 4,000 years ago, Abram and the God of Abraham, they were, they were one of like a billion small, not really God gods that were around. And so there was this like sacrificial system and altars and, and temples and all these things to so all of these different expressions of the faith. It was like anything you wanted to call a God, you could call a God and that's how it was. And it was that way for like a vast majority of our history. Monotheism comes onto the scene with Abraham. And when I say mono, right, it's the one God, like the one God, Abraham, Worship, believed in, and, and, and God showed up in his life. And so he was familiar, at least, with the way religion looked. But in this moment, these altars he built were not like the altars that we saw or we see in other religions, and they're not like the altars we eventually begin to see in the Hebrew text. There is no way for us to assume or say that these altars were built for sacrifices. So what were they built for? Verse 7, the Lord appeared to Abram and he said, to your offspring I will give this land. So he built an altar there to the Lord who had appeared to him. So walk through the scene. God appears to him and reminds him that he is going to give this land to him. And Abram's response is to build an altar. There's a geographical importance to it. And we're going to see this particularly in the story of the Israelites and particularly in Joshua is when they cross the Jordan River, they lay these stones down as this reminder that God has delivered them to this point. And so in some sense, that is what Abram is doing is he's acknowledging that God showed up and continued his promise in this place. But what I want you to also know, or what I also want you to understand in this is this is an altar of praise. An altar of worship is that he built this altar to glorify God who shows up in his story. Put a pen in that one. The second altar, verse 8. From there Abram and his crew went on toward the hills east of Bethel and pitched his tent with Bethel on the west and I on the east. There he built and altered to the Lord and called on the name of the Lord. Okay, this is a little different. 
What's different about it is God doesn't initiate this altar building. It's not like he came over here, God showed back up. Also, this space, it's going to be yours too, man. Just think about which one of your kin are going to live in this bed or this house or whatever. No, 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 no. At this point, he builds an altar and then proceeds to call upon the name of the Lord. At Shechem, God initiates this moment and he responds with building an altar. In Bethel, he establishes an altar in order to reach out to God. And so what we see here is the first altar in Shechem is an altar of praise, and and the second one that's in Bethel is an altar of prayer. And so what I do believe today, friends, is that God is calling you and me to begin the process in our lives of building altars and of, of worship and altars of prayer. I don't want to miss something. This is... Genesis 12, if we believe that this is one unified story and in it we can both understand a deeper love and admiration and understanding of God, but also we can have an understanding of our own nature, who we are, is what we see at the beginning of Abram's story, is that a proper and appropriate and necessary response to God's presence in our lives is to praise and to pray is to be a person of praise and to be a person of prayer. These aspects of a faithful life were absolutely woven into our created nature. Is that we are created for community with God. We are created to worship God. And here's what we see, is because of our fallen nature, we reject our created intention and we pursue worship and communion with all sorts of other things that ultimately fail us and lead us down paths of destruction. Because we were created for Christ and Christ alone. St. Augustine wrote a book called Confessions. St. Augustine's story, if you've been here for long enough, you've heard me talk about him eight and a half billion times. He's like one of my favorite just theological giants, you know. He, he was around 400, so 5th century, and he grew up in northern Africa, and he was afforded a life where he could go and just do whatever he wanted to do, and that's what he did as soon as he could. He moved out of northern Africa, moved into Europe, and just basically like hedonistically lived the fullest possible life possible. And when I say that, I mean like anything that you would be nervous to tell somebody about you did when you were 20, take that times 15, right? So that's how he lived, and he was crazy, and his mom just faithfully every day praying that he would know Jesus and give his life over to Jesus. Mom was a devout follower of Christ. Dad was not. He chose his dad's life until Jesus changed everything for him. And in this moment, he has this experience where he realizes that he is created for the worship and communion with God. And in his book, Confession, really early on in that book, he has this quote and he says, you have created us for yourself and our hearts are restless until they find their rest in you. This is the story of God and his people. That he creates us in Genesis chapter One, two, three, we fall apart. Four, we continue our rebellion. Five, we continue our rebellion. Six, we continue our, all the way up until today, we're continuing our rebellion. But but what God knows and what we know and we can quiet ourselves and be honest is that we were created for him. That's why we're called inherently in our DNA to be people of praise and worship. And if we're honest, we often direct those things to other people people, other things, other failures in our lives. So what do we do with this? Altars of praise and altars of prayer. Church, I want you to know that God, I think, is ultimately rebuilding his church universal. We're in a challenging season. I don't know about you all, but it feels like every other day there's a documentary just about how crazy Christians are, right? Like, anybody watch the shiny, happy people one with the Duggars? Am I hitting a sore spot for anybody? What about the Hillsong one? What about the Mars Hill podcast? Are are y'all familiar? Friends, are you here? All right. So that's three, like, mainstream 
ways that we've seen the church just get drugged through the mud. And, and here's the deal, what I want you to hear from me is because the church has failed in some tremendously awful ways. It's not like we're innocently being drugged through the mud. Like we have sold our souls often to things that ultimately do not satisfy. And we are reaping the consequences of that reality. And so we have a whole generation of young people in particular, but people across our whole country who are looking at this version of Christianity that are seeing work its way out and they're thinking, no, hard pass because if that's what it's about, I'm, I'm out on that. But I believe that God is regenerating or rebirthing the church even in the midst of this season. And what I believe that looks like first and foremost is when we start by setting a foundation to be about the things that God has put in our hearts to be about first and foremost. And that's people of praise and people of prayer. There's a whole bunch of other things. It's not exclusively those two things. It absolutely should be our starting place. Because if we center ourselves in understanding that God has created us for him and his purpose, if we daily through prayer spend time with the Lord and, and are transformed through that work, what I believe is that is the starting point for the kingdom of heaven to break out here on earth as it is in heaven. But it starts when we start to take serious these calls that we even see making their way out in Abram's story. So, what do we do with this? Number one, we're going to be altar builders, okay? But it's not going to look like you think it should look. Our first altar is going to be an altar of praise. And this comes directly out of Romans 12, 1 and 2. If you haven't heard me use this passage, you have either been asleep during sermons or this is your first or first of a few Sundays. Romans 12, 1 and 2. Write it down, commit it to memory. Paul is talking to the church in Rome, a church that is sharing so much of the challenges that we might share today. And he writes to them and he says, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. And he says, this is your true and proper worship. Do not be conformed to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. All of this tethered together, and if I can just break it down as simply as I can, is that the call for a follower of Jesus is to commit your life as an altar of praise. That your life is a direct reflection to the reality that God not only showed up in this story, but through Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit is daily showing up in our stories. So our lives as a response, in view of God's mercy, offer your bodies as living altars of praise. The second thing. How do we create space in our lives to build altars of prayer? How do we build space in our lives for altars of prayer? I just want to confess to you all. I do this too often, and I've already talked about this just a couple weeks ago. Prayer is like not not my greatest strength, okay? Let's just, that's as gentle as I'm going to put it. There's, I've been a Christian since I was five years old. I was baptized in a swimming pool, gave my life again to Jesus like four or five times until at 16 it finally took, right? Anybody got that story? It's like, yeah, this is my 17th time to commit my life to Jesus. I've been baptized 25 times. We only baptized once, mostly. So, (laughs) but I'm telling you from that moment on as I've always consistently struggled with a a regular prayer life. And that all changed about three years ago, about two and a half years ago. We had this, this kind of teaching moment where a pastor out of Missouri came and he just kind of walked us through his way of prayer. And, and that was a huge pivot point for me because what he gave me is this freedom to say that, that I felt intimidated by prayer because I had to be the one that was constantly creating the content of the prayer, right? You ever feel that when you're like, all right, I'm gonna pray, God, Thank you for today and for my family, for friends. Man, maybe if you could take care of this. And then you're like 15 seconds in and I'm out of content. Or if you're like me as well, as you maybe have some attention issues, 
And so next thing you know, you mention work, and then you're thinking about your commute to work and where you're going to stop for lunch and to dinner, and then you're going to be, you're like, oh, I'm supposed to be praying. And then you just heap guilt upon yourself because I'm just not a prayer, which means I can't do this because. And so what Brian Zahn did for me is he, he I have this prayer liturgy. And he says, we're so nervous about using other people's words to help us pray. And then he just said, this is an incredibly new idea. You know what the prayers of the early church were? Often they would pray the words that Jesus taught them to pray, but they would also go back to the Psalms and just pray the words that God had already written. And throughout our lives, we're part of 2,000 years of church history, and there are so many beautiful prayers that have been written for liturgical seasons and different things like that, and all of that is available to us so that we can speak these words that are just drenched in the Holy Spirit, and we allow God to respond in the midst of that. So that was the first paradigm shift. The other, and this is the one that's probably a little more doable for you and I, is to change our perspective on what prayer is. You know what prayer at its core level is? It's that you might go and be with your Father who loves you. I'm not at this point yet. My son still lives at home. He's 13, he turns 14 in August. For some of you, you're at this place where your kids have moved out. Maybe they're already having grandkids. Maybe you're just about to be an empty nester and you're trying to figure out what that's going to look like. If that's you, you know how sweet even the simplest contact can be from a kid that's moved out or a kid that's moved on. I want you to know that prayer is not about what you can create in your mouth to appease God. But at its most basic level, it's just being with your Father in heaven. That was the biggest paradigm shift for me. It's not a checklist. It's not saying the right words. It's not saying enough words. It's not, you know, did I pray enough for this or that? But it's just this opportunity through Jesus Christ. He gives us access to him. And so to create an altar of prayer is that its simplest form is to go be with Jesus. If, as we talked earlier, if we were created for communion with God, when we take seriously the building of altars of prayer in our lives, we are tuning in regularly to our created intention with our creator. Building altars of praise, building altars of prayer. That's what God is calling us as a people today to be. Like I said, it's a starting point. It's not the end of Abram's story. It's not the end of our story. But the first thing that God is calling you and I to do as we begin to think about how he might be wanting to rebuild this church is to recenter ourselves on the will and way of God in us and ultimately through us for the world. And I think that, I really do think that starts with us responding by building altars. I'm going to end with this. Um, if you even boil it down, just even simpler, why would I be compelled to build an altar? What has God done for me? I think the most profound part of Abram's story is Abram's story is the story that God shows up. And why I say it's beautiful is because it's a foreshadowing of what God does in and through his son when he shows up for you and I. And he doesn't just show up like, hey, I'm on the scene, just want to say hi, I'm going to head back up to heaven, y'all take it easy. But he shows up and he gives us these three years to show us how we can live in the world. And then he goes on the cross and he takes upon himself an atoning sacrifice for our brokenness, 
And then he goes to the grave and he wins that victory when the tomb is empty and he is bodily resurrected. And because he lives, we can live. Because God showed up in our story, our response, just like Abram's in chapter 12, verse 7, is God shows up, tells him that he's going to have people in Canaan, and God is stilling, still showing up today in and through the Holy Spirit and the person of Jesus. And if you don't believe that, then this is an opportunity for you to give your life over to that. Because you're not going to build an altar toward that which you don't know. That's what the Greeks did when Paul talks to them at Mars Hill. I see your altar that says to an unknown God. Well, he wants you to know and he wants I to know that what you think is unknown is actually Jesus Christ who died and was resurrected on the third day. We are created to worship. We're created for communion with God. And the truth is, is that we have given over what we're created to be and do to things that will lead us to paths of destruction. And God is calling us today to repent and turn back to him. And it's his love and kindness that leads us there to build altars of praise and altars of prayer. Let me pray for us. Most holy and gracious Father, we thank you for this opportunity to come together. We thank you, God, that by your grace, by your mercy, you show up in our lives. That you aren't just the God that showed up 3,500 years ago in Abram's story. You're not the God that just showed up 2,000 years ago in Jesus Christ. You are the God who by your spirit is daily showing up. And so Lord, we just confess that we have walked away from that. We confess that we have worshiped other gods that are not you and are not able to withstand the weight that being worshiped is, and they have led us down paths of destruction. We confess that we have overthought or underthought prayer, and you are calling us just to be with you. So in all of our ways, God, today we just come before you and say, today we will build an altar for our families, for our friends, for ourselves, for our church, as we will be a people of praise and prayer because that is fundamental to who you've called us to be. Jesus, be glorified. God, be glorified. Holy Spirit, come. Amen.